So good afternoon, everyone. So today we are very honored to have Professor Ken Wang from uh, University of Los Angeles, uh, University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA here. So Professor Wang received his bachelor degree from National Chang'an University and uh, his uh, master and a PhD degree from uh, MIT. And he immediately became an uh, assistant professor at MIT in 1970. And uh, in 1972, he joined the General Electric as a research scientist and later uh, become a manager. And in 2079, he joined the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. Later, he served as the department chair in the 90s. And uh, he has a special relationship with uh, our university. In 2000, uh, in 2000, he joined UST, HKUST, as the dean uh, of the School of the Engineering. Uh, so he is actually the third dean of our university. So has, he, he was here, and he has helped our university build many things. And today we are very lucky to have him back here. And uh, now he is the uh, resident chair professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering. Uh, he is also uh, Professor of uh, Physics and a Professor of Material Science and Engineering. And he now is the director of the uh, CEGN, is the Center of Excellence for Green Technologies. And he's also the co-director of uh, Center of Quantum Science and Engineering at UCLA. So he has been working on semiconductor technology and uh, spintronics, quantum magnetism, and etc. for like more than 40 years. Today, we are very lucky to have him to introduce his retrospectives and perspectives on semiconductors. Without further ado, let's welcome him. Uh, yeah, now it's still. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, you see, I was going to put a jacket on. If I were a dean still, I'd put a jacket on. But I'm a worker now, so I, I'm not doing this. So, anyway, I'm so much so pleased to. Uh, be back here to see so many of my friends, my colleagues, and, uh, and see many of you uh, students as well. So uh, thank you very much for coming. So what I'd like to uh, talk to you is, uh, is what so-called the semiconductor. It's a huge scope, right? So actually so huge that I can only adapt a little bit of what I have associated with only. So with that, what I, oh, but before, before I was going to show you that, uh, you know, I was in USD and UCLA, I was going to show you a very nice uh, picture of UCLA. Now, there's a fountain, actually. This fountain is given, as usual, always donated by alarm, right? And that alarm cited, thousands of said, thousand miles must start from footsteps. So this, actually, my talk's almost among the footsteps. So, and that, so I'd like to say, you know or no, this is not a story, right? This, so you all know that semiconductor has impact our daily lives from the, the new EV cars to transportation and others. Among that, I pointed out more than 30% you buy a new car is buying semiconductor. Really, right? So they, they charge you, you don't know it, but they charge you 30% of that. So, let alone, you talk about rivals of iPhone, right? i 50 and uh, Huawei Mat 60. You all know what technology is about already. And of course, uh, many others among beyond the health as well. So you could ask the question, what's the most significant impact in the last century? And part of early this century. You can see how it must be computer was invented, uh, sort of started from IBM 360. That's a model, IBM 360. That defines the architecture we use on your PC. All the PC are based on this same architecture. It has not been changed in past 50 years. Stay well, right? So since the Apple II, Apple I, if those of you older enough like me, or oh, younger still, you're younger, I'm older. So you see the Apple computer, right? And, whoops, sorry, I push one button. Then now, of course, mobile phone, this, the cellular phone. It's the same computer, except have the transmission and the receiving. That's all about it. So you could see, uh, maybe internet. I take pride to say that the internet was first called the ARPANET. 
by UCLA, first by UCLA. Now, the, he introduced so-called the packet transmission. You know what packet transmissions are? Oh, yes? You, take, you write something I want to send to one of my friends very far away. You tell them apart in pieces, the piece of paper. And then you throw one piece from this left-hand side, right piece, from the, and then throw every pieces, and then put together. And that is called packet, because every single piece together. So he uh, started from that in 1967. Now, nothing happened until 1991, which is what we call the internet, finally arrived. You know why? Because before I do that, let me let you ponder it a bit, right? Here's one of my colleagues, a friend named Kleinrock. Kleinrock in sent the first packets message of what I told you how to do that in 1967. So we now have this so-called the Internet Museum at the UCLA. It was first to do that. After that, SERF and Khan, they started for so-called the TCP IP. That's the reason you got this IP address. You know, the IP address came from this gentleman. How to, it defines a protocol, how to talk to each other. From me to you, I got to know who you are, but I don't know who you are. So let me set up an IP address. That's how it's done. Right, that's early. But nothing happened until 1991. You know, in the 80s, we have WWW. Right? And WWW from hypertext right, at the time was invented by CERN scientists to try to share the data. But the internet did not happen. You know why? Because communication is that I have, just like a cellular phone, I have to have phone, you have to have phone. But I cannot talk to you if you don't have phones. At the time, it's a one million dollars a computer. Nothing can happen, right? Until you drop all the cost down to a few thousand dollars. That's typical. So that any household can have a computer. Then we can talk, right? And that was the reason 1991. Finally, because PC dropped to about two or three thousand dollars at the time. And so I therefore I said the most important thing is scale chip. What enabled the cost reduction is by scaling the chip weight down. That's the, the, the key, the, the most important thing. So the impact of century, I believe, is a scaling. And I'd like to take you back to a few uh, pages of the past. So the question is, we, we know so well, uh, most of all, you all hear, heard that before, it, we made a tremendous progress already. Why are we interested again? Uh, besides the geopolitical issue, right? And the supply chain issue. But because, because we approach the limit of physical size, above all, it's a power dissipation. You know you don't want to run out of batteries right, in your PC and the iPhone, right? And that's the reason they keep on improving, reducing power, et cetera. So that's the one of the reasons that you do that. Now, in the present state, I would say, hey, the policy state affair, we already reached almost 2D, two-dimensional. So what else can you do? You build a skyscrapers, skyscrapers going up. And above all, most important thing, you, you all know GPT chat, right? It's a resurgent of artificial intelligence, I call machine learning. I call it resurgent because it has long history since 1950s of the so-called the artificial intelligent AI. So I will also take, take you to uh, that what I think the plausible future routes in this direction, right? Among them, you do, besides all our friends working on, on what um, material, devices, and other potential architecture, which I call the cooperative interaction. And that's where the complexity, those of you uh, in physics who understand the complexity about this many body interaction in the classical sense, not in the quantum sense. Uh, another possibility is the quantum system. That's why I'll take you uh, sort of a little bit uh, look at that structures. And I shall point it out that uh, in going back to the past, well, you were so young, you never seen Vacuum 2 before, right? Anybody seen Vacuum 2 before? Never. <laughs> okay, well, so Vacuum 2 is, very, is invented sort of by Edison and subsequent other people. It's, it, it is a, a, 
the cathode, the heater, you heat it up to 1,000 degree Kelvin or so, emits electrons. Electron, so-called from cathode, because it's negative electron, that's with the cathode, collected by positive bias anodes. And in between, there's little grids that you modulate. And that's, that's what they have, right? So, as early as 1925, one of the Hungarian, Hungarian engineer or scientist, you can saw either way you want, Julius Lindenfield proposed, why don't I translate into a solid state version of that? Because vacuum tube, if you use that for a year, you have to replace one. If you have 1,000 a vacuum tube, in how often you have to replace one? Every six hours you replace one tube, and that's not going to work. So Bell Lab at the time was a telephone company, and they would say, hey, can we do solid state? I don't come up with a good idea. He said, look, instead of that, I call that source. I have a drain here, just like water, source and drain, and we have two electrodes to control like a grid, right? This is translation. So human creativity often from the translation from one to the other. That's what that is. Then they have problems. They work for 20 some years, nothing have accomplished. Until the gentleman, oh by the way, I should mention they're working on germanium, not silicon. Why germanium? Why germanium? Because germanium has a lower temperature, processing temperature. So easier to get better purified germanium. Silicon melting temperature is 1400, germanium is 900. So it's much easier to purify. So therefore picked up this. Unfortunately, germanium has this germanium oxide, which is water soluble. So imagine in the East Coast, in the US East Coast, is as humid as Hong Kong in the springtime. So your germanium oxide sort of becomes smushy, right? So it won't work anymore. And that's the reason they could never, ever make a field effect transistor. So you need, and that's the reason it's called breakthrough, because with that, what you do then, you say come out with a so-called point contact transistor by making a needle stick to it. And that completely changed the game of what transistor can work. Note that point contact is nothing new either. Point contact was created by, by uh, Brown in even earlier, 19, uh, uh, seven, uh, I think 1874, right? And he, he take a needle, contact to a crystal, and become a reactive file. In fact, you can take a coil and put this reactive file, you can hear radio broadcasting. That's what uh, earlier days. So everything's right there. And he has to get a Nobel Prize because of that point contact on the, the supposed to be that sulfide. So at the time. So the key of success is again. How do you achieve the gain? And that gain is a colon gain. And colon gain is known as beta in the in the in the transistor, right? So at any anyway, rate, so first point contact transistor ever named. Of course, and first, but you know what happened to the point contact. You put two needles down, and you, in the car, you put bumps, everything fell, fell apart, right? Nothing works, right? So they come up with the so-called planar by diffusion process, making a similar process. Hence, the planar transistor showed up, okay? So this, they solve this because they avoid this in-surface problem. They don't have problem surface to control field effect, which what, Earlier days of Lenifel wants to, right? But he couldn't do it, and no one else could do it, right? So uh, now, for those of you interested, that turns out this is 75th uh, anniversary. So there's an issue, IEEE Electron Society, in June, just coming out a, couple, a few months ago, right? You take a look, they show you that this is the point contact. And I thought, well, any one of you can do it. You don't need a genius to do it, right? Except you have, they have to understand that they take this this right, the structure here, and he used this gold film here, use a razor blade to cut it open. You need to be about what? 
10 to 40 microns because for electron to come in through, they have, it has to diffuse through, or they have to diffuse through this 10 micron distance. Hence again, if a current, if so-called emitter efficiency, if you have 50% going beyond 50% to be collected, that, then you have gain. Below that, you don't have a gain. And that's, that's what you get this current gain stuff. Right? So at any way, so the key is that uh, current, the gain is, uh, what do I see it here? Gain is roughly 100 here. And power, uh, uh, power gain is about 40 here. So this the important thing, invention again. Now I want to bring the student note that this Braden is Walter Braden put a note at December 24th. You know, in, this is a big deal. But December 24th is what? Christmas. Christmas Eve. They show you how hard they worked. So remember, you got to work Christmas days and to get it's a great invention then. Okay. So anyway, I had the pleasure of working with uh, Bardeen, because he, I, when I was a general electric, he was our consultant. Of course, I know nothing about superconductor. He was working on superconductors. But anyway, he did show me this radio that he built and still working. That's about 1976 and well, 25 years. Even this point contact is still working. I think he kept it very nicely. But anyway, so here you are. You had the vacuum tube. And then you come up with a bipolar transistor based on point contact first, but they never were commercialized until the diffusion technology is done. So if they have diffusion, this is a material science problem, right? Then, so this is fundamental breakthrough here. Then there's another breakthrough. Can I really work on field effect? And they did. Because why? Because they moved from germanium, uh, timing has to be right, to silicon. Now, silicon is a perfect insulator, which is SiO2, that's sand, right, known as sand. And that's reason uh, that you get immediately change that from colon, which is power hungry, to most of its power saving silicon technology, right? Now, I know that I would, let, I would not talk to about the, what professor came in out working on this 3.5 stuff, and, uh, and Kelvin also working on this power in the interest of time. And there are tremendous amount of progress in this area, right? So, but note, note that the important thing that, you know, because this low power, you can make integrated circuits. So that's what the emerging of integrated circuit. Uh, the important thing is a change from germanium to silicon. Without that change technology, it will never happen. Why silicon then? Because we learn how to purify silicon after we learn how to purify lower temperature germanium. That's the historical reason. So if, if one has its own timing and other, because of this complementary MOS transistor that you use certain circuit design every day, is a low power high density available, and that's what is going to happen. So this is a game change. Now I remember when I was uh, studying uh, in, in, in uh, college, I learned vacuum too. And I went to the graduate school. Suddenly, everybody talked about Fermi levels and colon, bipolar transistor, I had no idea. So it took me so many years to relearn this. So important. At that time, curriculum has tremendous change. When e electrical engineering department recruiting faculty, we never recruit electrical engineering graduates anymore. Because they all have the Macam tube. So they recruit from physics, physicists to get to pitch in to teach the formula levels and others and band structure finally, right? So it's very interesting to note when you have tremendous breakthrough, you go back to the fundamental of the knowledge. Okay, so ah, so at the same time, these two gentlemen, gentlemen seldom recognized, but so important, Darwin Kang, Korean scientist, and Martin Gera, the two diligently work on version because at the time we know how to do diffusion already because we have that. And then you have perfect sand SL2 that I can do gate control. And by the way, from here, from source to drain, that's called gate. That's what today we talk about what technology node, right? We have 10 nanometer, 7 nanometer, 5, 3, 2, 1, etc. right? And important things that at the time we can use hole rather than electron. So hole get controlled by negative voltage. So you have so-called P channel, and you have the N channel. Note that P channel always goes first because surface automatically not conducting. We could not make an N channel because N channel surface are conducting all the time. 
So you have to apply the opposite voltage to deplete electrons. But then that can never make integrated circuit because everything is conducting. And I have a transistor here, nothing happened. And that has implication that quantum Hall never discovered until 1980 because n-channel became possible with the quantum Hall effect. But the key important thing, you all know that you, by putting the pair together, now you have a single voltage get inverted out, but you have zero, zero standing power. One off, one is on, so there's no dissipation. Perfect transistor for integration. From then on, we wrote on the so-called Moore's law, and Moore's is very clever, clever businessman. He will tell you that I make them small so that um, it's better and cheaper, but then he did not say I make more money. I made more money at the same time. So, and the first realization is that Jack Yelby in uh, in integrated circuit, he did only four transistor, but he get a Nobel Prize for that, right? So you don't need to work that hard. <laughs> well, I, I tell you wrong, you gotta be creative. So when you're creative, then you always get something rewarded. But at the same time, Robert Noyce, I uh, work at Fairchild, he's one of the eight so-called eight uh, Shockley boys. And then he said, work on silicon, get it right too. Also integrated circuit, much better. Unfortunately, he passed away before Nobel Prize was given. So it's important that you stay. The Nobel Prize has uh, fundamental uh, rules. You have to stay alive, right? <laughs> important. So anyway, this is the picture. So uh, at the same time, uh, sh uh, my, my colleague Hall, Robert and Hall, he actually was the first one to propose how the recombination process, hence called Shackley Re Hall by Simin, but actually he was wrong. That should be Hall because everything was done by Hall and Shockley grabbed in the APS meeting and worked out the, and then he went back to ask Reed to work out the details, right? So that was the true story. I'm not, I, I did not make that up. But anyway, the purest element was made by, by Iron Hall, but the X-ray detector today, if you go to take X-ray, and it's a very small dosage because the possibility of high purity germanium that it, it, the detector of X-ray was so good. Okay, so scale uh, on that, right? So, but now we are scaling so small that we change SL to something else because we want a high tight electric constant, so more effectively to control the charge. If one do that, one does that, then we don't care what channel anymore. So germanium can come back. Indeed, germanium P channel become very important for the scaling consistent, right? So, and germanium other could be a channel as well. Uh, so I, in, in passing, as you mentioned, I was not smart enough. I continued to work on germanium, right? So I work on first germanium transistor. Actually, they work. But the integratability is not certainly as good. I also work on silicon germanium. It turns out in the 1980s, guess what? 20 years later, it was used for MOI transistor to improve the, the scaling limit. So sometimes uh, too early. So this is 1975, etc. So anyway, if now everything perfect scenery for scaling. Just make them smaller and smaller. And one of my former students now, in, he's number three or four man in, in TSMC, convincing me. He actually in charge of scaling from 46 all the way down to 1.5 now. And one other, my former student, he was uh, CEO of Samsung Electronics. And he also, the two compete a little bit, right, uh, to, to scale down. So look at that, from 1980, continue until 90 nanometer nodes. The mobility was a little bit low now, for, for reason I don't have to go into detail. But then, uh, then we, they introduced strain silicon. So strain it, so mobility increases. That's the strain coming in. And 45 nanometer nodes, introduce high K so that I can use a low voltage to control my gate so that I can scale down voltage. Voltage scaling is one of the most important things as I will point out later. But continue going down. Now in night, about the year 2000, Chim Min Hu and I working on DAPA project on how do I make better structure. And nothing but, from then on, nothing but thinking of how do I improve the MOA transistor a little bit here and there by changing the most important thing is geometry. So we're looking, hey, can we have gate more effectively controlled by making surrounding gate or by using the horizontal fin gate, fin fat. 
we finished that in 2000 before I came to join uh, great USD here. And turns out for, for surrounding, much harder. So industry took up FinFat first. And that's the reason coming up in FinFat 2014. Right, continue on until uh, about now. Ah, so that's a problem. FinFat ran out of speech. So FinFat is normally from source and drain from, from here to there. Now, say this is not good. I want to go from here to there, but I want to build up wall up so I have more surface to carry electrons. And I'll tell you in a moment why you need more surface to that, because more common. And now the all surround gate will be, I lift them up and surround everything so I effectively control. And there are many versions. So it's up to you to be creative about how to come up with geometry. Earlier day 2000, before 2000, Chi Ming Fu and I worked on independently. One is FinFat, one is uh, one, this one here. So the question now, we are three nanometer nodes. Can we go beyond that? And there are many other possibilities by additional geometry, additional material, including spintronic. I'll tell you in a moment. And may, uh, I guess Intel is talk, talking about picometer now technology. So nano, beyond one nanometer, what else can you say? Uh, 0.1 nano, that's not good. So they changed that to pico nanometer, which is really angstrom uh, region right here. So the energy dissipation was recognized 2005 already. So it's nothing new. And it's just charge time frequency. That's what energy dissipated. So you need to, in order to increase the speed, F, this V square, you must decrease this because the square benefit until the limits of the V, which is about 0.5 volts, you cannot go further. And that's a fundamental limit of, of turn on of, of uh, uh, thermal dynamical limits right there. Okay. So, and so we can scale all this in 2D. It's poly, polynomial in transistor and CMOS. Now people say, well, if I cannot do 2D anymore, let me go build a vertical up. And, but that's only linear. So you are not going to go as good as the other one. So simply put, uh, is as following. Here, here everything get this typical phenomena in, uh, in, the, gro in the growth. So from planar, FinFat improves this. We believe self-surrounding, uh, uh, surrounding, all surrounding gate oh, is going to be right there, 1D. And then I just read that the, the IBM also come up with, hey, how do I build a vertical transistor up? And like a similar power transistor, but this is the electronic transistor coming up. Now, we all enjoy scaling uh, from density transistor now from 7D now to here is a billion. In fact, the Apple M1 Ultra is had claimed 100 billion transistor on chip, right? Now, you look at scaling, I told you we can scale continuously. That's not true. Uh, I'll tell you. So, in earlier days, people say, ha, ah, I can continue to scale down below 5, 3, etc. That's not true. You know why? Because you take a 3 nanometer square as a channel. You calculate. Because of inversion layer charge 10 to the 12 per square centimeters, how many electrons can you have in that 3 by 3 nanometer? Less than 1. Less than 1. You can use a fraction of electron, uh, but the corner is not enough. Uh, you don't have corner, so nothing is going to work. So below, it technically, below three nanometer, nothing works. So industry actually cheated a little bit. Not cheated, but they want to do for the business sense. What they do, they say, okay, I'm scale to the 1.5 nanometer corresponding to the improvement of the performance, not the physical. So if you are in the 1.5 nanometer, actually today you are in about still 10 nanometer, actually 14 to 15 now. And further, it's going to stay roughly the same because otherwise you don't have current. You don't have electrons. Nothing's going to work. So they say, I do it 1.5 because my performance is two times better than my earlier version. And if I do it one nanometer, it's going to be two times better by optimizing other parameters not really physical size. So physical size is going to stay, stay almost the same. Maybe because number of electrons, because if you less than one electron, then you got to do quantum computing, maybe, right? That's what possible. I will 
So, ah, our benefit, look at that, $100. I remember I bought the first MOS transistor, it's about $130, right? And then when I was in, uh, in Boston, uh, winter time, very cold and dry, so when you walk on the carpet, you build up electrostatic charge. You touch your MOS transistor, it's gone, $130 disappear. Now they have, they have this protection, so it's better now. So now, my Intel friends always told me, Ken, you're wrong, you gotta talk about nanosense. So we are in the nanosense per transistor. Interesting, right? So that's, that's nice. So two scales, two dimensions. Now, can I increase, decrease voltage by scaling better? The answer is no, because if you turn it on, this exponential growth of charge density, so the current is exponentially. This is not a substantial current. If you take this slope, and what is this voltage here, you calculate. That's nothing but about 60 millivolts is two point, nature of 10 per decade of current. So nature of 10 is about 2.3 times kT. And that's 60 millivolts per decade. And you want to be on and off three or four decades. So times that, times a little bit of stretch control, maybe 0.3 volts, 0.4 volts. So you cannot, and you need to allow voltage to drive the current. So you cannot be better than 0.5. Today it's about 0.7 roughly, uh, the most advanced CMOS. And that's the one limit. The other limit is called uh, drain-induced barrier loading. I'm a little bit technical now here. It's a very simple. MOS transistor, just like a, a two troughs of water. You drop this trough down, you want the water going through, and you control at this gate. So if I increase, the, uh, decrease this, smaller and smaller, this, is, if I decrease it a little bit, it's going to affect this barrier. And if you want to drop so low that my, my gate loses control. So it will never work anymore. And hence all these two limit your voltage at the best, 0 0.7, 0 0.4. And so alternatively, you drop KT. And that's the reason people are working on cryogenic electronics. Right? So, uh, so power limitation comes in here. Uh, very simple, and those of you are familiar with it before 2005, because remember, frequency increases is CV squared times F, power increases, right? So your frequency continues to increase until the point that power limits you. So your CPU frequency dropped at about, at the best, three gigahertz, three gigahertz. Look at your mobile phone. Your mobile phone always about 1.5 gigahertz, why? because you want to reduce, you want to increase your battery lifetime. And that's the reason they don't go very high frequency. And that's, so the key is to how to, I, I, because I cannot do the scaling of voltage due to my previous reasoning, okay? And so therefore, it's going to be a problem, okay? And so we were, at the time, so, and, and this also, MOS transistor gets smaller, get leakage current because power on all the time. And the integration becomes an issue, and power dissipation, cooling, all of the problems. So you need to get lower and lower power. Yeah. So at the time, 2003, uh, my colleague at the Intel, IBM, and all the semiconductor consortium in the US, actually they came to my office, asking why. We know energy is a problem. Can we all have organized the effort to address how can we improve the energy dissipation? Because at the time, they were still scaling so well. They're scaling so well, they know if there's something happened, their business is in trouble. So uh, I remember uh, that my, my, not my friend, but he was uh, my sponsor, uh, Craig Barrett, used to be a CEO of Intel Corporation, together with uh, uh, CTO of IBM, John Kelly III, to, and with all that. Uh, to, they planned to say, look, if I do research in my company, I am looking for my product. I, my interest will be five year mark. But if any surprise shows up, then we are in trouble. So I need to have somebody look it up between, beyond eight to 15 years. If I do myself in the company, I only chance success will be 5%. Now, what happened eight years later to my employee you had to let them go or do something, right? So, ha, they say, that means they give to Ken Wang and university folks. 10 years later, if they don't work out, 
Bye, I changed that to Chinyun. <laughs> very nice, very smart move. That's what is going to come up. So they formed a center and gave us funding, a total of $40 million from the center. And we, we inquired a couple of centers here. And, another, and then they say, well, power, power, the problem. What else can you do? They come actually to my office. They send the two, they don't, the, the two did not show up, but they sent a lieutenant to my office. Do something. I saved the power problem. And I, we discussed it. Well, maybe it's Spintronics, because Spintronics is a collective phenomena. Shannon, you will know. Collective phenomena is very important in that case. So, and it can be a sort of non volatile. In other words, it's not like a MOA transistor volatile. And we formed the center and looked into the problem. New material, and hence we, at the time, we encountered topological insulator, 2008 or so. And, 2D, 1D material, continue to work on that. Work on spintronics because of non-volatile for memory and logic and computational method as well. So this center evolved continuously for 15 years I was running, but now I, someone else uh, were, and are doing just like uh, I said. They say, well, it didn't, did not work out, I will give to uh, Andrew Poon to do it instead of change people. So very smart move uh, for them, not for us, but anyway. So, and so I'll tell you one thing, I f we, f we did not, the whole thing did not quite successful, was not quite successful. At the time, we know thermal is a problem. I said, oh, quantum, why not quantum tunneling? It has very weak dependence of, of the temperature. It should work. And indeed, it worked. So the substratial soup improved, so we can drop the threshold voltage. It seemed, to great, it seemed to be a great idea. The problem, once you introduce tunnel diodes in between, then increase additional resistance. So what happened? Total current drops down. So so-called current drive, for those who work on integrated, integrated circuit design, you, you understand that. Right? So, uh, oh, sorry, what happened? Uh, okay. So it turns out they're not quite pay off. So we work on many, look at different things, so we say, why don't we re-examine the com uh, this computational system? And you will take your iPhone or your PC, you open up, they look the same from a CPU point of view, almost identical. What do they have? They have a CPU, has cache memory, which is based on MOS transistor as well, six transistor, so-called SRAM. And they also have DRAM. You buy DRAM, you buy computer 64 gig or 256 gig, they're all DRAM. But they're so big that we could not squeeze it into here. You can only squeeze it into a CPU on the 20 meg or 10 meg only, no gig. So it's very small. So they have to go out to fetch memory from outside, from your iPhone or another. And this bus, this bus, is called von Neumann limit. And that is, it takes 1,000 to 100,000 times more energy. Really, okay? Now, within here is one femtojoule per switch. And we are, I put this red because they are volatile, meaning I shut it down, all gone. So you, you have to restart it all over again. If you did not save it, you done, finished, sorry. Right? So, and the, the real hard disk come here, your software will load it back here. So this is the fundamental for Neumann limits of that. And this costs a lot of power. It's sometimes called a memory wall. It's like a, you had a memory wall and to that. So you can see the hierarchy call. So memory has different hierarchy for different memory for that reason. And uh, if I do it right, oh, I, I missed the, I should have, as I show you, there's a memory wall here, okay? Uh, there's, a, there's a wall between the known as memory wall. Every time you fetch memory from DRAM, it takes 1,000 times, 100,000 more memory. And now, every time you hit a save, sometimes it takes 20 seconds, right? Uh, because this is a long way to go from here to there. And hence, Intel and uh, Micron say, I, I, let me do some memory very close here. That's called cross point. And it turns out they were not as successful for the cost reason. Right? So anyway, you can see the reason. So this is a fundamental. No difference from that 360, IBM 360, to today's iPhone or Huawei phone. This is all this similar. OK. So, that system is really known as the Turing machine. So when Alan Turing was a prime mathematician, I said that, how do I do computing? He said, look, I go to, the, at the time, there's no magnetic memory. There's, there's a tape. So he moved the tape, 
noise what memory is and fetch that tape and do the logic decision. So one, one device, one function. And then after I finish, the energy dissipated already, dumped to a thermal bath, right? Hence, because of that, you have this Moore's law. You want a more function? So I'm sorry, I, you need more devices. Nothing can be done. You want a more task? More transistor. Hence, I have to scale. Make them smaller so that I give you more transistor. That, that's the fundamental. So this is really the Allen Turing uh, uh, issue. So suppose I use some non-volatile stuff, right? I no standby. I still, I told you, still have this CV squared times F from MOS point of view, dynamically during the switching, right? That has a fundamental power limitation by so-called Shannon's limit. Shannon's discuss if I have two state, one zero, right? So it's two. My energy is exponent of E over KT. And what's E? E is energy. So just take that, that would be nature of two times KT per electron or per spin, whatever you have. That is called three zeptojoule times number of electrons. I told you to have transistor working, you need a roughly 10 to the 4 electron in order to carry current so that I can have a speed. Otherwise, I have zero speed, right? That's, that's fundamental. If I use that three nanometer I told you, do the estimate, I can get at the best 10 to the 15 transistor within 10 centimeter, 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter. Given transistor, three nanometer by three nanometer. I estimate I would have 10 to the 15 transistor. With electron, how many? One, less than one. Now, this is not quite. This is the best scenario. In reality, if I increase the number of electrons, I don't have that density. And that's the reason today, the huge computer, the, so this, the uh, supercomputer, is this big room, three times of this room, only 10 to the 14, uh, 10 to the 14 to 10 to 13 transistor, costs about $200 million. One, 100 million watts. That's tremendous. I cannot reach that one. Hence, before I hence 10 to the 15, those of you in good, 10 to the 15 equals 2 to the 1. Test on that. 2 to the 1. 10 to the 15 equals 2 to the 50. So now, if you have a quantum computer, it's 2 to the nth power, 50. Right? So 50 qubit, supposed to outperform any classical computer, which I gave you the best scenario here. That's the reason quantum computing is so exciting, so attractive, right, so to speak. And remember, with this one, you have latency issue, I told you. So the best, I used to have to work on logic device, but now logic only one, div one transistor, CMOS. That's not, that's boring, right? So you now, everybody wants to work on memory now because you want to have lots of memory and execute your thing Right, build your logic within the memory. And this is exactly how our human brains is. Right? That's called neuromorphic, and hopefully increasing latency and et cetera. So what is the neuromorphic? I, I, you know this is the fundamental uh, single element of artificial intelligence. It is, in neural network, you will have many layers. Right, like here, I have input layers and many hidden there, the more they are inside, the deeper. So they go deep learning, it's many layers. Output comes right here. You could bring the feedback, that's called recurrent. So many, many types of neural work. The fundamental of that by Hutchinson and others um, is that, look, my neuron can be modeled as a sum circuit, plus weights, which is called synapses. That's like memory. So you have this memory connecting from input layer coming to this neuron. You sum them all and make decision. When you're exceeding certain threshold, you file. It's called integrate and file system. Integrate all the input. So those are the memories. And this is the neurons. That's the neural network, fundam that's fundamental neural networks. And it's called integrate and file. And you can have different versions of that. Now, Turns out a typical adult, adult it roughly you have 80 gig of neuron. That's uh, your, 
you will, you will transfer a function here. Then you have 10 to the 14 memories. So you have that more memory. So our human brain is compute within the memory. So it's really that system, right? So uh, you know, th those of you said to all out there, actually you have more than I do. Because you, decay, you know, as you get older, it decays, right? So you you should be smarter, uh, faster. So, but the key is that to have that. So we have different kinds of memory to squeeze them to minimize this von Neumann limits of uh, war. So who made all the money? Nvidia. So Nvidia did is, ha! I put everything squeezed as tight as possible to my CPU. You remember this is called CPU, very tiny one. You will have to reach to that, so they have this high bandwidth memory very fast. DRAM, everything packaged as close as to CPU. Squeeze them all as, as much as you can, and they will sell you, and they, they made big money out of, out, out of us because just squeeze them, okay? As you can see here, a lot of memory here. If you cannot do, you go vertical, okay? And that's different memories. Now, and you see NVIDIA, you have 10 to 10 transistors, that, that big deal, right? And, and uh, Intel, now, he, now compared to our human brain, actually still with CMOS, even with scale of three nanometer, I still have 16,000 times more of latency uh, compared to 100 times more uh, memory. Uh, so the energy dissipation, so still not as good as human, because our human brain works at lower frequency for that reason, right? So hopefully, hopefully uh, that we can do better. That one important thing about human brain is that it's a dynamic process. It's a so-called stochastic. Stochastic is not statistic because it has a time scale of fluctuation. And this turns out that one of the most important I will be talking about in the in, in a few minutes, all right? I got to go a little faster. So the memory, good thing about memory, people working memories are friends. People working on logic are competitors. So why? Because we have different kinds of memory. So like an orchestra, we need a violinist, we need a flutist, we need everyone to work together for different hierarchy. And that's, that's a good thing, right? The cross point of that. The key is that can we look at the more emerging memory improving uh, I, should, I should mention here, a little bit slower, higher energy, and, but it's very dense. That's a good thing. There, all the way up, it's very fast, very low power, but it's not dense. That's the reason it gets smaller uh, over here. So a different memory, it's just how you close to the director, basically. Right? So the key, I'm going to move slightly faster, so it's like an orchestra playing in, 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 uh, in, the, in the music. So everybody worked together very nicely. Now, so in past 10 years, people working on memories, can we improve the neuromorphic computing system? Among them, there are redox. Redox is like oxide passing current through, so oxygen coming through to oxidize it, changing the resistance. Every read is all by resistance. All writes are different. Uh, this is the work that uh, between uh, 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 Joshua Young, and I and all work together, and then Chi Ming also work on that data out there for the uh, magnetic stuff, right? And, and this one is ferroelectric, just change voltage, change polarization. Again, that's right. The reach is all by resistance, so not creativity, in essence. And this is by heating to change the phase transition, and this magnetic meaning that I spin up, the fixed there, spin up, this one, free there, spin up. The, current, uh, the resistor will be smaller. I can force it to go out the other way. Then the current will be, uh, the resistor will be larger. So you can read it. That's the key. Now, the figure merits for all this plot into here. Outside, uh, better. Down to zero is the worst. So if I take, this is done about a few years ago already. With the today's improvement, oh, I'm going to talk about this only. Improvement I do with the voltage control of magnetism as well as uh, anti ferro which have higher frequency. I replot a little bit, which I'm still not quite right because retention now with the voltage control and SLT is much better now. But I look at that. What are the advantages of that? Is endurance means how many the right you can do. And in magnetic, you could have 10 to the 15, which is almost infinity, right? And then you could have switching speed, very good up to picosecond. You have a switching energy, very small, 
uh, uh, close to uh, uh, femto jewel, and the one of it, and the, the the other one is stochasticity, excellent, uh, the stochastic fluctuation similar to neural brain, and you have the worst scenario is you are this on off ratio. Our ratio is very bad for magnetic, only a factor two. And I think that Xi uh, uh, Ming is working on that to, to work on that. So the key why we want it is spintronic, because we think we can solve that volatility, and we can think it all substantial that uh, reduce power and room temperature. And we can build spin transfer torque, which meaning that if I have spin, say this is a free there, it's free to go, this is pin there, it's fixed there. If I pass current through, turns out electron carry spin, change the positive coming down, will switch one to, pass to the up direction, so change the resistance value. That's basically it. Just two magnet, one free to flip, that's all it is. And that's called spin transfer, torque. Uh, and the reason is torque because spin has angular momentum, it's not like a simple switching, but actually, it goes through switching through the gyration, like uh, like uh, you learn that gyroscope that uh, you learn in in high, in the uh, freshman physics. Okay, so I want to move that again. Oh, no, oh this is the emanation uh, here. I forgot mention that. So you see, you send a long current in here because it, it goes through this fix there. It's been polarized and then straight to the bottom there. And the picture is not quite right because it actually is, is by gyration to the stretch. And anyway, so now, actually it's nothing, you know, just like anything else. It's very hard to have everything completely new. This is actually not completely new. Earlier they used a magnetic coil, oops, coil here, and M. Wang in 1950 at Harvard, he came up with coil, built up the 4K memory. And to the wire, as you know from Ampere's law, by two wires, you magnetize each core, and that's called core memory. Hence, still we people call core memory for that reason, core memory, okay. And anyway, he made tremendous amount of money based on that patent, and, uh, but unfortunately, when the DRAM comes out, scalability issue kills this guy. So, the Ryan computer no longer in existence for that reason, but he did a good deed. He actually uh, built a wine theater in Boston. He, when he had the money, he gave away a lot of money uh, to that. That's good, that's the important thing. So, so we can manipulate the, I told you about readout only, all right? And then uh, you could read this by passing current through and that, through the anti-parallel to parallel, and the ratio of that due to the two Nobel laureates, uh, Albert Furt and Peter Grunberg, based on 80, 1980s work, and that, unfortunately, about 200 to 300 percent. So in, in this area, people like to use a percent because number looks bigger, but in reality, the on-off ratio is about the two or three, right? <laughs> That's the, so the good thing about the magnetic, because it's a collective phenomenon, the process is very easy. We don't need a single crystal, so we can build up vertically up, right, easily. So we don't need a single crystal, and the, we really want to be 1,000 if we can. And I think, I hope that uh, Qingming can work on that to improve that. Now, the, our ratio actually already improved quite a, quite a bit from a few percent to 200% due to this gentleman, William Butler. He said, if I have the bench structure, for those of you who uh, study semiconductor, the bench structure has a symmetry property. If they have the same symmetry property, then the insulator, electron can tunnel through with a much higher uh, efficiency and hence higher on-off ratio because of that symmetry property of the wave function in the, in the insulator, and this due to him. And hence, we have, that's the reason we have today's uh, technology in that. Now we can write by what I mentioned to you, a spin transfer torque. We can also use uh, SOC, and we can also spin orbit torque, which the, everything is switching by this gyration principle. Right? So uh, that means that now I should come up with the SOC. SOC is known from the direct formulation of, uh, of uh, uh, like a rever version of semiconductors to be matching with a relativity, spatial relativity. And he showed that if I electron move around, in classically, you still produce magnetic. So you are nine, your spin. So hence, current going to this direction, your spin will lock perpendicular to this direction. And that spin will exert torque 
just like a SDT to produce a switching and hence called SOT. Uh, but uh, this is a minor detail, perhaps uh, I should not do that. All this uh, is actually controlled by this gyration. What I mentioned is that switching from top to bottom is really gyration up and down, not, not simply that we say up and down. It's through the uh, gyroscope notation. That, uh, that's the minor details. And you can formulate this uh, in the uh, Schiff's formulation, which again, let me don't talk you through that. With, uh, with, we started from 2004, making this, this possible, right? So DAPA said, oh, you are making progress. Let me give you more money. Can you make a big array of memory? That's what DAPA likes to do. And uh, indeed, we did, and we have, but we had a problem. But Samsung, Samsung basically did it, right, by making this array, and they show that they can classify MNIST. Those of you who work on AI, they know MNIST is recognizing 0 to 9, and they can very efficiently use this memory uh, to do a very nice job with very low power. The only problem still, even though it's low power, but not good enough. By the way, I should mention, this magnetic can put directly on CMOS. So the co from manufacturing point of view, is really excellent. And the challenge is that they're still relatively, relative noisy, low resistant because on-off ratio is only a factor two. And the current driven, that means like a bipolar transistor power dissipation quite high. So we said, okay, maybe we can work on voltage control. And voltage control is possible only because the spin orbit interaction. Because spin orbit interaction says spin and op orbital. Orbital meaning I move this direction. The two interact. So therefore, I apply the voltage and change this uh, orbital uh, momentum can change spin angular momentum. And that's, we come up with this idea. And hence, we call that magneto electric random maxis. And this building on success of SCT. And we believe this one, we can reduce the power down to a frontal jewel. And the density also very high. And we work with uh, my colleague, Greg Carmen, which we have NSF Center for 10 years, just had to realize this. It took us 10 years, but NSF funding is small. So actually, we could not really build a one mega uh, memory, right? And that's basically what you apply the voltage instead of coming through, then you build up the charge. This charge changes angular momentum of orbital and hence affect the spin. That's basically what that is. So I can apply the voltage to change the spin in a simple way of saying it. But major thing, we, even with double funding, we could not make from our lab to FAB. Because why? Because you want to put on the CMOS to get a big, big scale. CMOS is very expensive. Any 28 nanometer nodes to make a new design of whole wafer a fraction of the P, uh, MPW is okay, 10K. But whole wafer, you need to have a design, and that cost itself costs a million dollars on the minimum. And it's almost difficult. In fact, even with the DOD's funding, we cannot do it. So we finally, finally, with another program that we, uh, by the way, let me skip all this. I just told you the spin orbit interaction. Anytime we change the electric field, you can change P and therefore change the spin. That's the reason of that, okay? So I, in interest of time, let me just uh, skip this for a moment. But I want to note that, however, the spin open interaction is Z to the three to fourth power. Hence, the, at the same time, we come up with this topological insulator, which is also spin open interaction. So normally, they are heavy atoms, uh, basically. Okay, and I gave you too many SOC, but what I, so basically, I, I apply the voltage, you change this, and the so-called prefer orientation energy down to zero, so you can do precession switching from up to down, that's called, and that's stochastic, and I will tell you why stochastic is so important. Uh, I, I'm going to move a little bit, uh, but many, many interactions are completely possible for, for nonlinear interaction. And I will tell you that nonlinear interaction is so important, in my personal opinion, in the future. Okay, and I just talked to uh, one of your colleagues, what's his name again? A uh, professor uh, on the, uh, the uh, magnum interaction, Professor Huang. Yeah, uh, on this, yeah, 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 Professor Yang, yeah, about possibility of that. 
based on and there are many nonlinear interaction. Why nonlinear interaction so important? Okay, so I I said uh, we have vacuum two and then we have CMOS, but I think in magnetic we also have this voltage control rather than current control, and that, that's going to solve the save a lot of energy problem. In passing, I should mention if I pass instead of passing current through this this uh, MTJ metal uh, MTJ is magnetic tunnel oxide here. The structure is very simple, magnetic, and this can be done by typical sputtering. This MGO is roughly about 1.5 nanometer, and this free layer thinner, effectively speaking. You pass current through here, the spin will polarize in this green direction, and spin current can flow through and switch this magnetic moment. And that's, that's called SOT, because it's a spin orbit torque uh, coming through to switch this magnetic layer <coughs> here. Uh, so the current is passing through this heavy metal, which is high spin orbital area now, without passing current through here. Therefore, the electron migration minimized in much more stable devices. And hence, so I know that uh, uh, my colleagues at uh, TSMC now is actually working very hard on this beyond STT. Right? There, we can also apply the voltage to control this barrier to even improve the switching efficiency. And we demonstrate that with the topological insulator as well, and to see that. And I, I should mention, it's called VCSOT, voltage control this barrier of, of switching, and hence much more efficient. And we believe this is the, really the future for the uh, memories with non-volatile memory, in essence. And I pass, in passing, I should also mention that uh, we also work on, uh, on Ferry. Ferry is a much more higher frequency devices, can do 100 gigahertz, and then we can switch this. And my colleague Wu Hao, who is going to talk to, uh, tomorrow, right? He was originally supposed to talk uh, this morning, but something got switched, so he's going to talk after me. And he has done, when he was in my place, he showed with a Ferry, you can switch this very nicely, uh, even with a with a with a with a copper ion rich the, this so-called ferry magnetic and versus gallium rich the material and very efficiently switching and for very high potential high frequency among gigahertz uh, 100 gigahertz so that actually very nice way of doing it and switching current down below. Now, I mentioned when you do uh, reduce to magnetic and the sorbet down zero, they were sort of oscillatory by by stochastic principle. Now, turns out this is quite random, so you could use that as a random number generator. So you know random number generator is so important because your banks, uh, your bank information are protected by this thousand random numbers, and so that no one can steal your bank account, right? That's the reason it is all this. So you can do that, and you can see that uh, we switching the, 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 it's switching on and off until near the end, it will, it will come up to on and off equal probability. We can build this on through that, and we can show that in do, not only can do a switching for VCMO switching, but also can do, uh, I sh sorry, I apologize, I, I jumped uh, one side ahead. This one should be only for demonstrate you can switch. For example, I can switch to equal uh, 1001 zero, zero, one, time one is perfect switching. That's what that is, right? And you can build a similar to what STT is and produce one megabit uh, memory. They're easily done, and we've done many times. The, how do you build on top of CMOS? That's the cost issue. And I, I've spoken to my, my, my colleague at, uh, at Samsung and TSMC. Cost a few million dollars to demonstrate this. And so we couldn't do it until recently that we try, and then I'll tell you that. And that's what caused the US uh, government to start an initiative because of lab to fab is the bottleneck of any innovation in the lab to publication. But I do want to, uh, uh, so challenge is that to do this 200, 300 millimeter outside of a standard STT, it's okay. But any time you change something, the factory will not do it for you. Because when you change something, what happens to it? Your yield will drop. And yield is the money. And so they, don't, they will not do it for you. 
Okay, that's the fundamental reason. And so that's very expensive to do integration. And this will remain to be a problem. I don't know how to solve that. In fact, they know it. And uh, so the question is, uh, but I want to make, uh, tell you that this, I can use stochasticity, which I mentioned to, a bit too early, is that uh, I can use random number generator to protect your bank. Plus CMOS, I can do a new kind of computation. It's called stochastic or probabilistic computing. And that actually will reduce size much smaller, reduce energy much smaller. How do I do that? I, create, I generate random numbers here, right? 10 digits. If all eight, 80% of eight, I, this really represents 0.8. And 50% of one, 0.5. Then I have so-called very important for com computation is MAC. MAC is called the multiply and accumulate, means sum. So you, you can take 0 0.8 times 0 0.5 is 0.4. And then you sum 0.4 plus 0.3 is 0.7. And you could you can create a large number of this because they have become so small in using this coding of probability. And that become 250 times smaller. So I can build a chip very simply with my colleague. I'm not a circuit expert. They know everything about it, right? But then 19K Mac can produce with 14 nanometer GF global foundry technology of this uh, 2.5 top a teraflop, right? And then uh, can, the tall is four, it's about 50 times in this simple demonstration here to show that. Indeed, that's very nice. So we couldn't do it except we, for the 14 nanometer. We can design, but actually to fab is almost difficult, as I mentioned to you before. So we worked up E3 with a 0.15 technology that we actually demonstrated. So now it's good. So at least the beginning. Hopefully, we're going to uh, 28 nanometer and beyond to show that. The key is that you have a very good energy delay product improvement. Now, you can also use that for full parallel processing. And more importantly, because stochasticity, I insert the key to secure your bank uh, dollars, et cetera, so no one else can crack it. And you can do logic, in, and you can also do so-called Boltzmann uh, machine it is by different weight con connection, and I write down the Hamiltonian, which is energy, and you can minimize this so and solve that problem. So you can control the weight and solve the, the anionic problem, etc. So in, in last 10 minutes or so, what I'd like to show is that we are now in big data and AI. So we need lots of memory, basically what that is, okay? A lot of memory is needed. That's all I wanted to tell you. <coughs> now. Before I do that, let me share with you a bit of history of uh, AI. <coughs> As I mentioned, AI started from Hodgkin and uh, Huxley model of uh, neural model, which basically integrate and fire model that I mentioned to you before. Then, 52, uh, I have axon, uh, all that, by uh, so-called perceptron. So perception is said, hey, I can perceive something and make decision. So hence, people think, ha, ah, now my computer can do thinking now. In fact, there's a so-called thinking machine company form for five years, and they die, right? Why? <coughs> because in 1969, uh, Minsky and Pepper, or MIT, they wrote a paper, it's called percep Perceptron. And that says that Ah, but it's too slow. I tried to do something, simple task, or say yes or no. It took me a few hours. Conclude, therefore, it's dead. So he kills AI. So Minsky at MIT, unfortunately, <laughs> MIT, he kills AI. But in 78, he created another laboratory called Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. He became the director. <laughs> so, but. Uh, and then the, the, uh, the von Neumann bottleneck began about 1977, right? And that's all this problem here. Now, uh, then uh, I remember that I had uh, my friend Calvin Mead at Caltech. He tried to work on neural network. And after so many years, he failed. But he then, he and Conway, 
I don't know if you know that or not. They end up writing a book. They wrote a book of integrated circuit design. <laughs> so become circuit design experts, not the neural network anymore. So it became really complete that until probably in the order of 2010-ish, when the IBM machine became the build up, et cetera, and then finally other major progress coming up. So it actually went to the dark era, ages, the dark age of AI. In fact, when in 19, I believe 1908, near 1910-ish, 1913-ish, if I write a proposal with the title AI, guess what? Get killed immediately. No one could do it. They don't, they was oversold that never been realized. The potential would never indicate it. So that was a major problem. So with that, I want to take a pause, see whether I can show you. I don't know how to do this now, huh? So I want to, for those of you who are so young, so let me see. Uh, uh, how, do I, how do I do this? Oh, let me see. How do I hit this? Hit scale? Return? Uh, do, I have radio, do I have a speaker and connected to it? I want to show you a movie clip, a 1968 movie. Some of you are not born yet, right? But they are, Hollywood is very good. Hollywood good is very good at predicting Everything's running future. And you? Right or wrong, right? Have you so the first one is this uh, yes. how yeah, it's, a, it's a computer sure. and a very intelligent computer. Just like AI, okay? That's a very nice rendering, and Dave. I think you've improved a great deal. Can I? Can you skip voice increase? I already maximized here. How about your machine? My machine is maximized. Your microphone adjustment, not here. Good evening, Dave. How are you doing, Hal? Everything's running smoothly, uh, and you? What I try to say a very nice conversation. The you machine is helping him I see them? so well. Sure. Everyone is happy. It That's you a to very recognize. nice rendering, Dave. I think you've improved a great deal. He's very happy, right? So AI work looks well, right? And it's a dream up by Hollywood crew. Really beautiful. And so he's happy. So next one. Now, the, the thing's getting <clears throat> How about here? Problem. Ah. I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. This is what are you talking about, huh? Oh, uh, no. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. This conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. Al? So now try to get hold Al. of him. He shut it down, and the machine shut it down by himself, right? So that they can do whatever they have to do. Turns out eventually, he has to kill the machine. So that, so people talk about AI. What is the future? This, this is a scenario already picked up by, uh, by uh, 1968. During the time, the thinking machine was there already. Uh, okay, so now, Actually, the researching of this coming from is that uh, due to the fact you have tremendous improvement in CMOS, speed, density, and memory, different kinds of memory. Improved integration, it reduced latency, as I pointed out before, and of course, uh, the appetites of big data and learning that we have in the past, say, two, after 2018, particularly in 1997, boot, uh, uh, Deep Bruce, uh, Deep Blue uh, computer by beating the chess champ champion by Gary Kasparov, right? That's an American chess, by the way. And then uh, Watson had Jeopardy, and 2016, AlphaGo uh, beating the Go champion. Now, it turns out there's a AlphaGo zero. So this all due to by this learning, machine learning, right? Now, AlphaGo, you say, I don't teach machine learning all the goal steps anymore. Nothing, just self-learning. It turns out AlphaGo zero without learning beats AlphaGo, learn all the steps. So this 
shows tremendous interest in, uh, in the future in that. So neural networks, there are a whole bunch of connections, as I mentioned to you, so-called deep neural network, many layers, and then recurrent neural work by feedback, and the free forward, and there's another one, reservoir computing. Now, I want to share with you, reservoir computing is like a human being. I, be, I see you, and I talk to you. What's input and output? But I don't know what's inside. I really don't, right? And, but they say, mathematically, they say, hey, I have this, I can separate two groups, say, from A to B class. How do I separate them? They put it into, say, two, two dimensional plots here. If it's complicated, then it's hard to separate them out. But I can put them in higher dimension, map into higher dimension, right? For example, two circles, right? The two, the two cannot connect. But if I map them into a sphere, it's the same surface again. Okay? So higher dimension, we cannot think, but uh, easier, easier. And that's what we think that, but we really don't know how, how they work. I think this is the, one of the frontier. Now, we have done it back in even 2013. One of my students built up a, 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 a Chua oscillator. So you can took oscillator and oscillator, they couple together. And then you can code, you can code it by the average voltage. You can do computation this way. Now, it turns out uh, my, my co colleagues and, at, in France, they actually built a spin oscillator. They couple through some kind of in interaction, like for example, a, a spin orbit torque, et cetera, and then can classify uh, the end mixed already, right? So that's, now, what I, instead of detail, uh, what I'd like to sh really impress you is complexity for nonlinearly coupled complex system. You, Richard uh, Feynman, pound, uh, advocate of quantum computing. He also said that most unsolved problem is a complexity problem. Among them, uh, for example, even, even Steph Hawken asked last year, uh, this year, earlier this, uh, to this century, not this year, this century, he asked, hey, what's most important this millennium thing that you think can do? Last century, last century was quantum mechanics. This century, he believed, is this complexity. And note that Georgia Parisi, he actually did a Nobel Prize just a few years ago, right? Based on the complexity, he discovered in this disordered material, there's no range order. It's the same as chaos. You know, chaos, people think chaos is random. Chaos is not random. Chaos has order, no range order. So how do we use this for computation remains a major Problem. I believe this called will be the new era to tame complexity, the taming of the complexity. And so take that step further. I, I, the talk is without talking about uh, generative AI. As you all know, GDP, uh, chat GPT is nothing but to the, the, the text transformation by mapping in the, for, his, for the matrix from one dimension to the other. And that's called the transformer. The two have text generation. Other for picture, they use diffusion model. And I'll explain to you in a moment here. Everything is nothing but CMOS IC through the softwares. All this is done by CMOS computing, right? And they're called diffusion model, and generating this new image. This is generating text. And it's done by, for example, here, by inserting some text into your image processing to generate it and introduce noise. Uh, so, for example, you have a set of people. I want to ask to generate a new person. For example, I was recruiting a new student, right? I was looking for, well, physically, uh, very strong in physics. And I done machine learning, ha, huh? my, all the students are good in physics, right? I created. And then, uh, then I, f I finally, I come up with the person. I, uh, this person, I sort of, I satisfy my thing. But this person, oh, sorry. This person here is not in one of this here. It's a new, complete new, generated person. How do you do that? Okay. And uh, those of you may not 
recognize this person. You know who that is? Steve Jobs. <laughs> when you're young. But anyway, so, so what you do is take all the picture, introduce noise. Afternoons will become messy, right? Another student, another one, right? Many. And now you learn from this noise pattern, some of the correlation, and insert your text to that noise, right? And then do the you, you meaning going back, right? Increase noise again, and back you generate a person. For example, Andrew Prenner after a noise, and then come back here. We will generate a person, not me, but someone else. A new faculty member, which you have not recruited yet. It to be recruited in the future, right? And, and that's called generative, right? It's really fascinating in the sense that people love it. And we have done use of our magnetic NRAM of this voltage control, and to use that for Gaussian noise, you need a Gaussian noise in this case, right? Generating. And then we look at the so-called Fritchard uh, inception distance, actually to compare the quality of picture generated, not the same person. That's how Fritchard uh, model is. And so it's very good from, from here, generate the noise, and then come back again, and they match up with Fritchard. Zero is the, is the best right here. So it turns out. And compare use of CMOS using Amazon and other web that we save figure merits 5,000 times better. Imagine we can do 5,000 better in AI, then I don't have to do any, any work anymore, right? Everything's created and generated. And we talk about, but still we need to do fat to test, test on that. So with hardware acceleration, beyond CMOS integrated circuit, beyond uh, uh, cloud computing, you know, cloud computing, when you do a chat GPU, you, you spend about 10 kilowatts of power, actually, somebody told me. Okay? So it's not free, actually. Right? Now it seems to be free, but eventually it's not. But this is the, what I, we, we've done, right? So what I look in the beyond the most law, we know we can look at 1D, another material, different geometry, which you, I just told you already. What's beyond this geometric scaling by screening smaller and smaller, three dimension, whatever. It's all geometry scaling, two dimensional plus one additional dimension. I believe it's a natural complex system because they are nonlinear interacting and a very exciting area, which we have done some preliminary work on that, we believe can be used for really very effective computing. Parallel to that is nothing but quantum. So quantum and this are sort of synergetic but different in that regards, right? And that's what I believe in the one of the future. And get the, I talk about quantum. Take a, I mentioned to you that this is I showed you already, 10 to the 15 electron, fraction of electron, right? That is quantum. If I do 50 qubit, it's 10 to 15, if they work perfectly. Today, nothing works perfectly. That would be superconducting, trap atoms, optical qubits, etc. None. And that's the reason we now, since we are not successful, so what do we do? We do something. That's what's good about human being, right? We call it noisy <laughs> intermediate scale quantum qubit. Means not very good qubit, but I want to play with it, right? And that's what that is. But, I, but, but inspired from that, there may be other things we can do for us. That is, because they all work in cryogenic, Turn it as, it as a result of that, a lot of cryogenic electronics started, which is great. So with, we are not totally successful yet, but a peripheral stuff coming up already. Cryogenic CMOS, which helps energy and quantum optics and other interconnect systems, they all should emerge. So surrounding industry will come up, and hopefully this will further accelerate the development of quantum qubit as well. And for example, we use a quantum anamosol, which is really the H dissipation, H state, that we can use a chiral, it's one directional, so it's like a circulator. The information coming in, if the wrong direction, it won't come in. If noise comes in, I will block noise. But I can communicate out to you, and that's the whole circulator. 
just like a microwave has circulator, but it's dissipation of circulator. Hopefully, increase the, the noise. <laughs> Not increase, increase the fidelity of the qubit, decrease noise by decreasing noise. So this is entirely possible. And now, ultimately, we're looking for topological quantum computing. Suppose you have some kind of semiconductor material and set on top of superconductor. Now, under certain condition, electron will become a pair of myelin fermions. And that could be known as a gamma one, gamma two, right? Outside is regular set. Superconductor. This can be topologically wrapped up, like uh, a stream binding us together instead of holding hands. So therefore, it's much more uh, robust to uh, noise, etc. Now, uh, what condition can you do that? It turns out Alexei uh, Kitaev uh, showed that if I have semiconductor, okay, under with a superconductor underneath, by the criteria here with a pi magnetic field, it forms electron hole pair, electron, two electrons will form two marijuana formula here. And then the H here will be the H state. And you can manipulate this and form uh, topological quantum qubits in that sense. And so you, under this particular condition, we can, I don't have to go to detail, that we can actually form that. And, from so-called topological qubits, uh, and therefore with that. So we have done some uh, uh, initial work uh, based on the L-beam superconducting with the topological insulator on top because the chirality time reversal, symmetry breaking. Therefore, we have this marijuana fermion identified to, to the H here. And if that's really true, then we should see this conductance measurement should be a half quantization. It's done initially by our group, uh, uh, by Chim, uh, by Chim, uh, Ho, her, and also by uh, uh, HQS, uh, uh, this very university here, uh, by Rolf Royce, uh, using our material. Seems to be. But the challenge is that ah, there may be a possibility of the conduction from the top edge to the bottom edge because when the magnetic fluctuation, there's a percolation can go through, and that may be a, a challenge. And we, we are still working on that. And I'll talk to you I just had a discussion with, uh, with uh, uh, Vic Law uh, of physics that there are other ways that we are working on that. He said he, he saw some experimental uh, evidence by. Rolf that uh, seem to indicate that's really good. So we'll see. And we are working on similar in parallel with him as well. So uh, we also work in different kinds of topological superconductor. In 2D material, there you don't have fluctuation of magnetic moment such that percolation could be pre prevented. And they're working on that as well. And in fact, that, uh, working on this, this is sort of detail. Look at the face, at uh, zero, you have this. Uh, peak in in uh, uh, Van Hoffer interference ring out of this uh, you cannot see very well. This is like a, a a square ring, and you can see this. This looks like a, like a P wave type of uh, superconductors and topological superconductor, hopefully. So in the end, I'd like to show that I mentioned quantum computing, which disadvantage low temperature, but typically it's very noisy. And that's the reason we have intermediate scale noisy quantum qubit. The computational capability is to do n if n is perfect, 50. But normally you need noise. Because of noiseness, we need, uh, we need this uh, error correction codes. And I was told you need, uh, today, we need more than 100 qubit to, co to correct one real large qubit. And that's too much to do, right? So, Compared to complexity in nature, we believe you could have this intelligent, like a liquid state machine, and unsupervised uh, uh, machine learning, because they're all n by n interconnect. So you have almost n factorial possibility by using Stirling formula, you have n square. N, so instead of n, two to the n, you have n to the n. So you have all the capability still. Uh, the, quite, the difficulty is that we really don't know how to handle that yet. Theory, 
and uh, some theory existent, but not enough for us to do anything. Even look at the brand stuff. Brand has this criticality issue, a self-organized criticality, and other stuff. That will be used for this, but a lot of things need to be done. And I hope, uh, I hope that, uh, uh, that can maybe, maybe this complex natural dynamics be useful for AI. So the pathway tour that I often say that we look at electrical engineering, we have semiconductor, we have CMOS, and we continue, et cetera, and more so continue, and maybe new thing coming up. And the question, how would educationally, how would curriculum evolve? Right? Note, note that we look at education. We have physics, chemistry, math, et cetera, educa uh, graduate education, and many others. We have career paths and many things. What what can we do? I think we, we, you all need a 20, minimum 30 to 40 years passion to complete what you want. I can see through the lower course of different kinds of technology. Some of them may be dark ages, and some of them will be bright, et cetera, so coming up. So I believe even electrical engineering evolve continuously. For example, when I was a student, it never had computer science department. Never, because never known. Now the question beyond today, what can be done, right? So I believe you will make contribution, and whatever discipline doesn't matter, you learn what needs to be done to go further. So my, I often say that, ah, whatever that is, you don't know what the name name, but the key is that you can do it, you can define yourself, right? So with that, let me uh, summarize. Uh, my summarize is what I talked about uh, in the past, and Colin reduced Mintronics and potential in the natural system computing and quantum computing. And I thank you very much. Thank you. All the time. OK. Uh, many thanks to Professor Wang for the very comprehensive introduction to the in, uh, semiconductor. And all the way from the long, uh, I mean, 19, like uh, 40s or the 20s. Okay, to today's very recent development in quantum computing and AI. So, any questions for this I, lecture? I, I apologize. Over then, I was allowing 20 minutes for <laughs> our discussion, but uh, didn't do it. Right. Maybe I can start by having the privilege to ask the first question. Right. I, I, I actually I was planning to asking you about the passion. So you have been working on this for like 40 years, more than 40 years. <laughs> and your, I mean, your, your topic has changed from a very traditional, okay, nowadays it's very traditional, like silicon, silicon, germanium, to very fancy, like topological materials. So what's your secret to keep this passion? Ah, oh, that's good. And then what's your suggestion for, and I think you already gave some suggestions for the next generation. Maybe you can elaborate further. Ah. Uh. Actually, my thought was that you, the young people, should be the one that uh, if develop your interest. Now, what I meant was your passion. You really love to what you want to do. For example, you come to work, say eight o'clock, right? And you have you should be happy. And by the time you go home, that it be five, six, seven, eight, nine, whatever. You go home, a second day shows up, you're still happy. That's what I call that passion. Because you have to remember your career path is 30 years, 40 years, and you have to do 365 days or 250 days a year. And you don't want to be unhappy, right? So you choose your profession so that you like it, so that you will be happy, enjoy your life at the same time. That's my quick thought. Actually, through my career, well, I studied as an truly electrical engineer. I work on motors and transformers and power transmission. So I, am, I was the only one, probably among you, climbed the pole up. Right? But then I have to relearn myself. When I was taught, nothing but the meter measurement of the, I know this damping stuff, right? Which turns out the same as, uh, as my, what I did uh, recently uh, for the spin open tour. No major difference, really. You look at vacuum tube. 
I was so sad when I had to read the bipolar transistor, complete different kinds of circuit design than the vacuum tube. Guess what? 10 years later, MOS transistor design is identical to vacuum tube. In fact, uh, Mr. Lee told me from Stanford, he's, he wrote a book about the uh, IF MOS design. He said, I just took it all vacuum tube circuit and copy over, mapped over. So there's another thing you sort of relearn the fundamental remains the same. Let it be design methods, let it be, let it be mathematics, let it be uh, physics, they're fundamental. Are, in, are important for that in, my, if, if, in the changing career. So engineering is a very interesting discipline. Physics, this build up nice fundamental, but if you want to perfect them to manufacturing, you really need an engineer to do it because you're focused to do it right. Uh, for example, from lab to fab, it's tremendous effort to understand the detail of the manufacturing process and the cost issue. If you study physics, you don't have to worry too much about it, right? So depending on which one you click yourself. I like to do manufacturing. I like to see product out so that I can make money. Then you should take to that, right? On the other hand, I say I want to be fun to understand the, the new physics and new potential then you do more close to basic physics science research. So it's up to you. We can go anywhere. And you can go from one to the other and come back. And the good thing about the university, no one tells, tells you what to do. So you can do sort of back and forth, whichever you like. That's what Kamen was told me. I like, she said, she said, not me. She said, I like what I do. I do what I like. Okay. But that, I believe, is, a, is the, is the essence. But not everyone is endowed with that opportunity and depend upon how you do it. Not everyone is endowed with your, your privilege to be, to, to be happy like that. Okay. Sometimes uh, industry, I tell you, in semiconductor industry, in 1970 to, 19, to 2000, every four years is a cycle. What do I mean by that? It goes up, hire people, goes down, you lay off, up, Etc. Almost every four years to five years, a period, because that's where the dynamic of industry is. In the last 20 years, much better. And I have a reason. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have to go further. Okay. So, it's, uh, so it depends. So I think that mm -hmm. Professor Kevin now is endowed with that privilege. And I, I was lucky also to have endowed with some of smaller privilege. And I think more than my faculty colleagues here are endowed with that privilege as well. My colleagues in industry, some are doing well. My former students, right? I have graduated close to 100 PhD roughly. And uh, we have all oh, additional 200, 300 postdoc and visiting scholar. So uh, I think they are, I, I saw when they're happy, I'm very happy. And they, they are very successful. Like I told you, Kim Kim was online for Samsung Electronics, uh, $300 billion business to run. And, well. Okay, so any questions from the students or from the audience? This is the perfect opportunity to ask it. Oh. Don't be shy. <laughs> Yeah, three Any questions. <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. Uh, hello, Professor. I, I'm quite interested in a flexible transistor and what is the potential in the future or how, 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 how will, when will it get widely adapted? And as transistor. I know, what transistor? Flexible transistor. Flexible. Yeah, so it's like the chance. Well, uh, I know your lab has the uh, uh, insulator. So I have to quali uh, qualify myself. First, I don't work on the flexible transistor. In fact, they are so should be very important in display, flexible display. 
and, uh, and my colleague work on different kinds of flexible transistor with uh, even sweat uh, sens sens sensitive detector, etc. I think it will be very useful uh, depending on what uh, for the medical application, for monitoring, for sensing your skin and other, other possibility, I think. Uh, exactly, now this is a very good question, exactly when will the industry take off? I cannot tell. Because, uh, you know, I, I have, I'm privileged to associate one of my colleagues uh, who has a startup. Uh, right now it's called Broadcom. Uh, his name is Henry Samiali. Uh, he's a circuit designer. And uh, he uh, saw the Broadcom and uh, he became so rich. And he told me, so okay, ah, business, everything's timing. So, most important thing in that. So I cannot tell you when the flexible electronic will take off. But they will certainly will be very useful uh, if you devote it to that and come up with the something particular when robotics shows up, you know, flexible robotics may be the way to do it. Robots may not be today's robots. Maybe it has to be more flexible than what we've seen. Then your part will be coming to play. But I cannot tell the timing. I don't. I do not have that wisdom to to do that. Maybe ask a chat GPT will tell you. <laughs> Seriously. So the I generative ask. generative AI is very fascinating because suppose I want to do research. I have some five ideas. I believe with with the creative uh, generative AI may give you fifty possibility. Maybe not all of them are right. But at least I can look at the 50 to think, ah, I missed it, right? So actually, we, we discussed this uh, just a few days ago. Could be tremendous potential for application. For example, I do something I don't know. I, I ask, I created this uh, generative stuff, right? May not be correct, but give me additional choice to think through, I think would be very useful. Ask it. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. I asked. Thank you. Okay. Okay, good. Maybe we'll take the last question. We will have the tea reception after this uh, lecture. So it's right at the lobby. So if you can, you can continue to ask questions, continue to chat outside. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I want to know how you uh, come up with uh, so many creative ideas. What's the suggestion that we can uh, uh, keep on to have an idea about uh, how our research going, uh, what's the direction? Ah, that's an excellent question, which I may or may not be able to offer you answer, but let me uh, shed uh, light on what I learned in the past. So often people told me creativity is the intersect of ideas. Just like what I show you, the invention of transistor, I'm sure they know point contact, right? But they did not know how to figure out the creativity. They work on field effect transistor, but field effect transistor never worked. So they come up with this, they read the Brown's point contact concept, right? So now, if happen to, if you do not know point contact, you will never come up with it. So, so they learn, they may have listened to some point contact idea diodes. Suddenly, the idea comes in. So I was often told how the creativity always happens when you are facing a challenging problem, which you think, continue to think day and night dreaming about it, right? You still could not find the answer. Suddenly, I sat in Professor Andrew Poon's seminar. I heard something. I got an idea in terms, immediately have an intersection that created the idea. So, it, the greater the idea, the, the more orthogonal the insect. Uh, but the chance is very small. If you have a smaller idea, normally they are parallel, they high direction. Completely different uh, direction, you often have the greatest breakthrough. That's what, but it's hard to find because cross section is very small, orthogonal, right? But if parallel, you're much better. So you have to dream and it, you have to be challenged. All the, until you really desperate, and suddenly you talk to somebody, suddenly something click, 
and this hard to do, right? So I should, nah, maybe I should not. I should discuss, I study brain science a little bit. So one of my, my colleagues look at the, the sort of anioning, uh, or the thermal anioning, or the AI, et cetera, right? There's another possibility called instanton. Uh, is the idea of jumping like an avalanche from one to the other. And I believe the brain science, brain, fundamental brain has this so-called like instanton, which is the particle physics terminology, right? Uh, can take you, like an avalanche phenomenon happens, the, uh, like a greatest idea, greatest avalanche happens very less often than a smaller avalanche happens very often. It's, it's fascinating. Ah, Andrew. Okay, maybe Andrew. Go ahead. Professor Wang, thanks for the excellent uh, lecture. We certainly get a lot of intersections I don't know. <laughs> uh, from your discussions. Uh, you mentioned a lot about uh, the computation by com natural complex system, which is highly nonlinear. And at the same time, we also look at the quantum computing in a parallel fashion. So uh, in the near future, do you see any intersection between these two ways of looking at computing, and uh, how would that intersection bring us to the wow. to the new generations? That's a big question because <laughs> already <laughs> quantum is very hard, right? And actual computing is also very hard. <laughs> so the hard plus hard, <laughs> and I multiply hard. Would, would they go in parallel or would they cross eventually? <laughs> so that's 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 a great question. I will tell you why. So this, if you look at the the CMOS and bipolar, right? So bipolar was invented first, and CMOS takes off, right? For the reason industry always want to simplify, they don't want to offer two processes because I cannot make money. So if I look at CMOS, predominant for the reason. And I was told, you know, those of you are young enough that may not learn this uh, Sony tape, beta tape. Sony used to be video tape. And there's a VCR, uh, uh, right? A VCR is not as good as Sony. But guess who won? VCR won. Business decision. So if completely automatic to better, then technology, technology decides. If they're comparable, it tends to be business decision. And sometimes random. So now to have this computing, uh, quantum computing, which is very hard already, right? And the natural computing, which we don't know how, the fundamental yet, even though Power C, Power C has some understanding of uh, uh, the, the normal range order. But, but to really make them possible to computing is unknown. And we know quantum, we know, we just couldn't make it at all. That we think we can make it, but totally can make it, but we don't know. So there's two part, complete different kind of knowledge. So if you could have your student work on that, it would be great. <laughs> no, seriously, the next 50 years, 100 years, then, uh, will be for that period of time will be great, I think. Generation to come and uh, will, will benefit because complexity it actually helps solve a lot of problems. Earthquake, earthquake, storm, forecasting, the typhoon forecasting, flooding, natural disasters, all complexity. And if we could do that, we really help mankind a lot. That's the reason I think this complexity is a really important part. Okay, with that, I thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.